So, hello everybody. I'm glad that you are watching today and listening here. Um, we have a special guest today. It's Bert Kempner. Hello, Bert. Good to have you here. It's so good to be here. Thank you so much. Let me introduce you to the few people who don't know you. Uh, you are a children's books author. You are a producer and a scriptwriter. Yes, that's right. For documentary and uh, nonprofit programming and educational material. Okay. All right. Wonderful. And uh, as a children's book books author, I wanted to ask you about the, the book that I saw. I think it's your last book, The Five Fierce Tigers of Rosa Martinez. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I looked into it, I read it, and I, I was wondering how much of this book is your own experience? Well, I'll give you the backstory on it. Please. Uh, okay, here, here, envision this. Uh, I had a doctor misdiagnose something going on with me, and as a result, I almost died from Ooh. the internal bleeding. Mm. And I was lying in the hospital really weak. I couldn't even really lift my head. And I was kind of feeling isolated and vulnerable and, and feeling, oh, maybe the medical profession left, let me down. And just suddenly out of nowhere, there were these five tigers in my head. Whoa, where'd these guys come from? Yeah. I, I knew they were there. I knew everything about them. I, I knew their names, I knew their backstories. Um, and I knew that they were there to help me. Mm -hmm. And a day or so later, I, I totally recovered. And I'm sure it was blood transfusions, but I, I think it was my tigers too. So, so I'm sorry, when I got home from the hospital, I said, why should I keep this to myself? Mm -hmm. This was wonderfully healing for me. So I wrote it in the form of a children's book so that yeah. children and their parents uh, could find hope in it, can find inspiration in it. And uh, from the reviews that I've gotten from people, they do. Yeah, yes, I can understand. As I said, I, I read the book, I really can understand. So what's your explanation? Where did they come from? From probably from my imagination or mm -hmm. who am I to say? <laughs> you know, maybe. With maybe names. From, mm -hmm. from another dimension or... or, or uh, I, I believe in everyday miracles. Yeah. So, mm. so it's, yeah. Where they came from, but but that they came. That's that's the important thing. Yeah. And do do you do you have a tool? Do you have uh, an ad, or an advice how we all can access our guardian animals or how we can get to this place to maybe in a situation similar to well, hopefully not similar to yours, but in in a situation of pain and stress, how to access our guardian animals? Let, let me, okay, I, I recently co-led a workshop in New Mexico on uh, shamanic writing. And it was, it was really interesting because I'd never led one before. And I was, I was terribly sick at the time, but I, I said, I cannot not do this. And I have to be out there and do it. And I loved every minute of it. And fortunately, so did the attendees. But one thing we concentrated on is locating those voices that have been lost to us through the stress of everyday life, through all these pressures on us uh, to color inside the lines from schools, from parents. Um, so we, we had these, these people imagine all sorts of, well, like, like this is an old Elizabeth Gilbert exercise, but we had them write letters to themselves, not from themselves, but from the fear that lives within them. And it was amazing yeah. what they came up with. And later we had them do animals, um, you know, because the oldest language of the world is, is not Sanskrit or Babylonian, it's nature. Yeah, indeed. We don't know how to speak, and we've lost that ability. Yeah. And I think it's, it, it's critical that we regain it. Yes, I agree with you. Yes, I definitely agree with you. And uh, 
So when you, this was a shamanic workshop, you said, because shamans are always connected to nature. That's, that's right. part, uh, part of that's their right. work and part of access, their healing. They have mm. access to the voices uh, mm. th th that we don't hear in, 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 yeah. in day living. Mm. Oh, that sounds, that sounds beautiful indeed. And you transferred it into writing then, since you are a writer. So your part was putting it into words and uh, write whatever was going on. Mm. But you know, we, we, can, we can all do that. You don't have to be a writer or an artist or a sculptor or anything like that. We can do it uh, in the way we make a cake where we design a bridge. Uh, you know, the, the, the most horrible thing I hear people say is, oh, I'm not creative. Mm. We all, we were born creative. Mm. You ask any kindergarten teacher and they'll say, oh, these kids are genius, but it gets knocked out of them yeah. by, by the system. So yeah, you can bring creativity to almost any activity. Yeah. And uh, if I come back to nature, because I indeed find it so extremely important to reconnect back to nature, we are part of nature, so uh, it's also reconnecting back to ourselves, and to combine it with writing. So what you are saying is they, you, you would invite the participants to write about their experience or their inner experience? or their inner experience, but then... Uh... Imagine what 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 must it be like to to write like a mountain. <laughs> ah, okay, <laughs> this way, yeah. Yeah, mm. you know, what would a tree have to say to us? Mm. Uh, and and when you get them, our workshop had lots of meditations and and things designed to get them out of the the everyday world and put them in a different sphere. And once you get to that place, then yeah, you, all of a sudden this this wonderful information is available to you. Mm. So it was, some of the writing was just fabulous. Yeah. I was so happy. Mm. So if we suggested to our listeners here today, it would be to really listen to nature, first of all, to, as you say, to listen to the mountain or here where I am right now, to listen to the trees. I see the trees uh, out here and then uh, whatever I understand from the tree that I just see right now, to, to put it into my language, to the language that I'm using, to a linear writing process, because the tree is not talking in a linear way. Precisely. Mm. You, you've got it exactly. Yeah, that's beautiful, because as you say, we all can do that. Yeah. The, the yeah. Japanese have a term uh, for actually going out, being in the forest, walking slowly, breathing, uh, and it translates to forest bathing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, a, what a wonderful term that is. Yes. And, and mm -hmm. how, how better off we'd all be if we could engage in that once or twice a day. Yes. And it also makes me think, because I often suggest also to my clients to go out into nature, and breathe, as you say, but very, very quickly we get distracted. And when we walk in nature, we are still in our thinking process. But if I now, from now on, will suggest to listen, to really listen to what nature has to say, I mean, wherever you are, the sea or the mountain, uh, that maybe then we get out of this permanent thinking process and really focus on nature. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Very nice. You know, early, early people, they could, they could, uh, the, the wind ruffling through the trees was like their newspaper. They could tell a whole lot mm -hmm. from, from what was going on or, mm -hmm. around them, from animal tracks. Mm -hmm. um, there were all these things in nature that they can read. They didn't need uh, video games. Mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. this was their entertainment, this was their education, mm -hmm. and I, I, I think it's, I know it's not possible for all of us to go back to that sort of thing, but if we can find some modern equivalent, mm -hmm. I think that would be wonderful. Yeah, uh, we just could use our ears and our senses, and uh, uh, we have the senses also to, to touch and to see and to listen. 
Yeah. Well, let me come to another question because I know that you are writing children's books. Evidently, we spoke yeah. about it. How come? I mean, you, when I look at you, you're not a child, at least not from the outside. No, no, no. I, I, I just uh, finished my uh, 69th circuit around the sun. And so, yeah, it's been a while. I had, um, when my son, who was now 25, when he was little, I didn't like any of his books. Or I didn't like, you know, most of them I just found preachy or, or, or silly. So I made up stories for him and, and he grew up loving them. And there was one in particular that I liked. So I figured it was about a narcoleptic whale and uh, two navies hit him on either side because he's asleep. And they figured they would discovered a new territory and they both claim it for their own countries. And they're about to go to war over the sleeping whale. Um, and, and so I sent it to publishers, I guess, in the early 90s, when the first Iraq war was going on. And they said, oh, no, no, we can't publish this now. It's, it's good, but we can't possibly publish it. You know, and I would say, why? He says, well, it's an anti-war book. I said, what, what, what better time to publish one than during a war? But uh, no, it, it lay there for around 13 years. And then finally, I found a publisher who um, was very happy with it. Mm. And so I started uh, with that publisher. I published a couple books with them. And this one is self-published, The Five mm. Fierce Tigers of Rosa Martinez. Mm. Um, and I've got a new series coming out that I'm really excited about. This, this one is, uh, it's kind of a Hogwarts, but it's not for kids, it's for animals, and the subject matter isn't magic, but it's survival. Okay. And mm -hmm. uh, in each adventure, this, this action team is sent out into the world. It's, it consists of a young, impetuous female elephant, her uh, wise-cracking best friend, who's a cattle egret, and a mysterious white lion, who's an emissary from the stars. And they go out to help an endangered species in each new adventure. Uh, but it's not preachy. It, it's a serious topic, obviously. But mm -hmm. there is, is humor in it. Mm -hmm. The cattle egret provides a lot of comic relief. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I want them to list kids. If, if, if kids, by the time they're adults, if, if they have little experience of nature, they're not going to fight to, to protect it. Mm -hmm. No. No, we will we will come to this. Um, what we maybe as adults can can uh, help our children to understand from our lived experience, but uh, still with your children's books because I find it striking. Um, as a, as a psychologist, I work with the inner child that we all have. So there is a child inside of us. Because when you started to write children's books, you said it was because you didn't like the ones that existed. But in the meantime, your children are adults and you're still writing children's books. So there must be something in there for you. Is it maybe the child inside of you that likes to be entertained as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. the, the long and short answer is yes. Yes. Uh, so. I, I usually write something because I don't see it around me or, or you know, I say, well, it doesn't exist. And, and that's what I want to see. So I'll create it myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, but it satisfies, there is an inner child in me. There's, there's, I, I was a rare kid in that I had a very, very happy childhood. And yet I had all these imaginary playmates uh, I, a lot of things that, that unhappy kids do, I, I did from the stance of being happy. Uh, and, and I've never lost that. Yeah. I'm, I'm still a, you know, a kid who likes to turn out rocks and see what's underneath there. You like to do that? Yes. Yes, ever, and I still do. Now I'm 70 years old now, and I still <laughs> do it. Well, good for you. I wish that we all would do that. And uh, I mean, I, I, I function in a similar way. 
maybe not what's underneath the rock, but I go into nature and I actually physically speak with nature, which sometimes appears quite awkward to the people who walk by when I have a conversation with a tree. I, I think that it would be lovely if we all would live this side in us that we all have, I believe, but we needed to suppress in order to adjust what we thought society wanted from us. So I really uh, think it's, it's so wonderful that you contribute to the world still this side, this child side in us and benefit from it yourself and have us all benefit. And you said humor, you use humor as well. Yes, I, I, think, I think it's, it's vitally important because it mm -hmm. does help the medicine go down. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Kids like things that are funny if, if, if you mm -hmm. test them. And they mm -hmm. say, what do you look for most in books? And, uh, I think the majority would say something funny. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah I, 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 I think it's, it's, it's absolutely, um, it, not everybody, not every writer is funny. No. But if you can get it in there, that's fine. My second book was about a moose in mm -hmm. Canada who, um, he, uh, he suddenly grows a golden chin hair. Okay. <laughs> All of a sudden, he's gotten along fine with the other animals in the forest. Suddenly, he thinks he's the hottest thing on earth. Mm -hmm. He's too good for his friends now. He's going to have to go to Hollywood mm -hmm. to uh, become a star. And so he makes the trip to Hollywood, and he's being ignored everywhere he goes. And finally, he's... Sitting, standing on a street corner, just desolate, and this limo pulls up, and this little round guy with a beret says, "Oh, you're perfect. You're perfect. You're absolutely perfect." And he says he's an A-list producer. He's having a party that night. He would love for him to be there. He's going to meet all of these wonderful actors and actresses. So he uh, shows up, and they and he said, "What do I do? What do I do?" And they said, "Well, you just stand in this corner." right here and the guests come in and they start throwing their clothes on him. He becomes nothing but a coat hanger. <laughs> okay. yeah. And so he's learned his lesson and he makes his way back to the mm -hmm. Canadian uh, woods and, and, yeah. and asks to be readmitted. Mm -hmm. And his golden chin hair goes to make up an owl's nest. Oh. So it's mm -hmm. at least doing something useful. Right. So there, there is a little tiny little teaching in it, but with, with a lot of humor, with a lot of humor in a funny, in a funny way, uh, as you say, so that the medicine goes down with a little bit of honey. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it kind of takes a little dig at the celebrity culture we mm. have. And also the importance of being yourself. Yeah, exactly. And the golden hair, as you say, it, it then uh, turns it into something useful. Uh, as well. Yes. <laughs> yes. So are there always animals uh, in your stories? Yes. Mm. Because I love them. Mm. And, and I, fi I find my voice with them. Mm -hmm. and, and just uh, sit there figuring out what animals would say and feel. Yeah. It is tremendous fun for me. This mm. is the whole process for me. I, 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 I wish your viewers could could see me when I'm writing. First of all, I got my playlist up to, you know, 11. It's loud, it's loud. And I'm sitting here and I'm writing and I'm cackling my head off. I am sitting here laughing. I am having more fun that should be legally permitted. <laughs> yeah. I, I so enjoy it. I get into a trance. Maybe it, it, it takes me around six hours to do a book. Wow. Yeah. That's... Yeah, because I am totally in the zone for six straight hours. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, you can kind of I, you can kind of fold me up and put me in a drawer for a while because I'm totally exhausted. Yeah, uh, I can imagine. Yes, it yeah. is a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Yeah. So this, what I hear is, first of all, you your relationship is with your inner animals and maybe also outer animals, but animals. I mean, for me, it's really plants and, and yeah. So we all have our, probably our, our different entrance 
to the other world, as the shamans also would say. Um, and you really go into a lot of fantasy, if I hear you right, where, 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 and imagination, imagination. Where does it come from, in your view? It's magic. <laughs> magic. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, 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 I don't mean to be glib or anything like that, but it is. Mm -hmm. It's magic. Mm -hmm. Stuff plays deep within the imagination. Yeah. So do you think we all can go into this space of imagination? Absolutely. Or, yeah. Absolutely. But m most of us uh, cut ourselves off by saying, oh, I'm not creative. Mm. <coughs> Meaning they have one idea of creativity, which is you know, a writer or a filmmaker or something. But there are, there are dozens of mm. ways to be creative. Mm. Hundreds. Mm. Yes. And people just stop before they can get started. And also, I think this idea of being reasonable and being an adult and behaving like an adult stops us as well. I mean, what I see in you is you are so uh, in tune with this inner boy that resides in you and, and it's okay. For you, it's absolutely, you live it. But for so many people, they try to deny it because they want to be reasonable. And I think this is a shame because the, the imagination and the, uh, our fantasy and everything that we, we perceive besides the spoken word is there. And it, it's a shame to cut ourselves off that. I think like you, we all should allow us to go into that imagination. And we don't all have to become a writer like you, but just, it's fun, fun, just to live that. It's fun in life. But you know, there, there are these two words, childlike and childish. Yes. Yeah, so yes. childlike, we're, this we're is... We're going to be childlike. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we are afraid to be childish or judged as childish, yes. Mm. So we were touching a little bit into this, uh, or you mentioned it to the children and the world that we present to our children. Uh, I know when we spoke the other day that you also me mentioned the word responsibility, that we have a responsibility towards our children. Uh, is there something that you could say, something more that you could say about it? What do you feel? is our responsibility. Yeah, well, what kind of a world are we going to leave them right now? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's the height of irresponsibility, I think, to mm -hmm. hand them this, this ticking time bomb and said, here, it's all yours. Mm -hmm. uh, we created, helped create this situation. We have to uh, uncreate it. And, and at this point, it's going to take many generations to fix. But we have to make a start. Mm -hmm. How can we? How, how can we make a start? There are there are things that we could do. We have to get off fossil fuels, for for one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we 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 have to live within the carrying capacity of this earth. Mm -hmm. um, I I think there are seven billion people on the planet right now. Uh, the the carrying capacity is probably for a healthy planet is three billion. Now I'm not saying we kill each other off or well, we can we can stop having as many children as we do. Um, there, there, are, there are so many things. You just if if I could get one thing into people's heads before I die, it is that we are all interconnected. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what happens to one species happens to every species. Mm -hmm. You you can't remove building blocks and not expect. You're, you're building the collapse. Mm -hmm. and, and if we don't watch it, it's going to happen on our watch. Mm. Uh, since you are a writer, does this also, is this reflected in your books as well, this uh, concern that you have? Very much. Very much. Very, very much so, especially in this newest series, the uh, what I call wildlife prep, that's the name of the school. Mm -hmm. uh, environmental concerns are, are uppermost mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <coughs> because so many of the problems confronting species are environmentally uh, related. 
Mm. And is this also why you say, if I if I recall correctly, that it is for adults? It's not just for children. It's for, or what what were you saying in this respect? It's I, for children. I, I, I say laughingly when people say, "What age group?" Are you yeah. I, I say, well, six to 12 and then above 25. Mm -hmm. because adults, there's a lot in there that adults will get and the kids won't because I figured if I have to read a book to a kid hundreds of times, I might as well enjoy it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so there's humor in there, for instance, in the moose book. Mm -hmm. there's, a, um, there's a really obnoxious beaver with a thatch of, of yellow hair called Justin Beaver. <laughs> and there's also Ike and Tina Turtle. Uh, <laughs> a six-year-old isn't going to get with that. Yeah, but, but, but yeah a, a, adults will, will get it. So, and, and plus the, the themes are, are things that adults can appreciate too. Yeah, okay. And this aspect of environment uh, evidently must be reflected in there too or the fact that you uh, what you said and i fully agree that we are all that everything is interconnected that's yep. is there a reflection in that book too yes mm. yeah it, it really is um mm. in, in in one of the uh wildlife prep books it's about uh stranded dolphins and whales mm. and and the explanation for the stranding is first that the dolphins are saying they're sick of being sea creatures because of everything they want to become land creatures again and that's why they're crawling out mm -hmm. onto the land um but there, there's a great sadness too and, and and something i take on in the book is that a lot of this beachings are caused by sonar Mm -hmm. from the Navy, especially the U.S. Navy. Mm -hmm. I think, oh, you're going to take on the U.S. Navy in a kid's book? But I think I found a way to do it. Good, yes. And this is a series you say that's already out? There or? are three books. No, it's not out yet. Uh, we're, we're hoping to introduce it as a TV, animated TV, mm -hmm. thing, and, and then publish a line of books. Three of the books are done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm working on the fourth. Okay, in six hours. <laughs> yes. I, I had, I, I, what, can, I, can I engage in 30 seconds of unseemly boasting? <laughs> okay. Uh, the second book, the Moose book, I, I sat down around nine in the morning. I, I finished, you know, like five, six hours later. <clears throat> I just said, I can't make this any better. And so I sent it to the publisher and she accepted it right away. And by that evening I had a contract. So I went to having absolutely nothing when I was in the shower that morning to a signed contract for a book that evening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That doesn't happen. It hasn't happened before and I doubt it'll happen again. But that was, that was one time the spirits were with me. Everything was, was aligned in my favor. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what I hear too, and maybe this is something for, for our listeners as well, to, to think about that you really dive into it. You're not distracted. Yeah, you're entirely, if I imagine, it's my imagination. I'm, I'm not next to you there, I have no idea. But that you are completely focused, completely uh, absorbed by your characters and, and by the story. The rest of the world just falls away. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's only this this little happy zone in me. All right. And my characters. Yeah. So, um, do you eat or drink during that time? No. 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 I I might have some water. Yeah. Everything, but no, that that's of secondary importance. Yeah. Uh, I no, not until I'm, uh, you know, the, I'm, I'm ready to stop. Yeah. I mean, six hours might be too much for all of us, but the idea to really focus on something that is, uh, that inspires, you are uh, inspired when you do that. Yeah. It's, it's your inspiration. It's your heart. It's everything that's in there. So 
to do that for all of us, maybe for half an hour or an hour per day would be very healing, I would say. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and I should say that, that before those six hours take place, I might walk around for six months with mm. characters in my head and, and then suddenly it starts falling into the place, what I want them to do and how I connect it with a plot. So, you know, six hours has a long gestation period. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, or like I would call it an incubation. So yeah, there's yes, something. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, I mean, I'm in Europe. As you know, you are in the United States and I heard uh, in the beginning that you give workshops. Uh, if listeners here today are interested, uh, can they somehow contact you? Or if uh, yeah, at, at this point, I don't have any schedule until next May. Okay. Uh, in the Seattle area. I'm mm -hmm. in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, if people want to contact me, I'm at B Kempner, K E M P N E R, at Cox, C O X dot net. And, and I'll be happy to talk to anybody, you know, yeah. about anything. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I, then I will take your, yeah, I will take uh, the name of your, of your website. It is your website, right? Uh, yeah, my website is not active yet. It's okay. Just, well, what the, what you just uh, gave. That's, what, that's my, my home email. Oh, it was an email address. Sorry. Okay. So I will um, write your email address underneath our interview so that uh, people can write to you. My uh, website will be live uh, very soon. It, my company is Mild Wild Media. Wild, mild? Mild, mild Wild Media. Media, okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of like, like you know, my, my gentle side and, and my wild side. I, I, I am known in some circles as shape-shifting bear. Yeah, <laughs> okay. People should, people should know that just because I'm gentle doesn't mean I'm tame. Mm. Yeah, it's lovely to to see and uh, to see you, you know, um, at a young age still, because I have to say it, I'm the same age, uh, mm -hmm. and have all uh, this child, this fantasy, this imagination, and um, hunger also for ex exploration, exploring and writing it down inside of you. I think it's so lovely to, for everybody who is listening here to see you and hopefully be inspired to write herself or to go out or allow the imagination to come out in one or the other way. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. if, if, I, if I could, I would just, can I hold my, my book up for a second? Please, please do. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's The Five Fierce Tigers of yeah. Martinez. And it's available through Amazon or Barnes mm -hmm. Noble. Um, and I, I hope people will give it a, a read. I think they'll enjoy it. Yes. And besides your book, I think you as a manifestation of this imagination, it's just lovely to, to hear you because it, it, to read your books is, is wonderful. But to see you as a human being with all these sides is fascinating as well. So, Bert, uh, is there something you would like to add here today? Something that I have not um, asked or touched into? Something that you would like to share with our audience? This is the moment to do. It's, it's, it's almost, I, I came across today a quote from Ray Bradbury, mm -hmm. who wrote Fahrenheit 451. Mm -hmm. and, and my, favorite, my favorite book, by the way. Is it? Okay. Yes, well, it said, is have to burn books to destroy a culture right you mm. just have to get people to stop reading them mm. so anything that we can do to get people back to reading I, I i think would be a wonderful contribution because it's it's an intimate experience it, it's a liberating experience and it's something that the other media do not provide mm. uh so if, if you had kids, even if it's reading the ingredients on a cake mix, just get them to read. Mm. Because they're going to be working for somebody who does read. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank uh, you. 
And thank you for being here today with us. Uh, lovely talking to you. Uh, it was a you. I, I wish you all the very best. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, and bye-bye everybody, and bye-bye Bird. Bye. Bye-bye.